This mining or bioprospecting of the human gut could hold the key to new treatment for a range of bowel disorders. Investigators, now aware of the existence of these billions of health-giving bacteria, are attempting to isolate specific ones. The challenge is to match the right bacteria with the right disease. One investigator in UCC has done just that, and with a disorder which to date has been notoriously difficult to categorise and treat. One of the really big breakthroughs in the last few years in the area of irritable bowel syndrome is simply that it's been taken seriously. Now, with advances in several aspects of research, from the laboratory to the clinic and all the way to community surveys, we appreciate that irritable bowel syndrome is a real disorder. Professor Eamon Quigley has dedicated his professional life to the search for health-giving bacteria present in the gut in the hope of bringing relief to the many thousands of sufferers of irritable bowel syndrome, or IBS, symptoms of which include anything from severe cramping and diarrhoea to bloating and constipation. In many cases, it can have a profound effect on people's lives. I would say the loss of a very close friend was a huge factor in what has happened in my life. I just broke in every way, physically, mentally, I just fell apart. I had a lot of problems with eating. I was in pain, so much pain, physical and mental. I just felt very low. I wasn't fit to work and I just needed help badly. I must say it went on for five or six years. I just didn't have any great quality of life. It was affecting my husband and children, and I just needed help. I really wanted to go and find something. So I was trying different specialists. I was trying to find an end to this horror that I was living. One way that we can look at the gastrointestinal tract is we can look at it as a river. In health, the river flows calmly and evenly and moves along its contents in an orderly fashion from beginning to end. If, however, the river is blocked or there's some other disturbance to flow, we can see the consequences. The flow becomes turbulent. In the same way in our intestines, if there is a blockage through spasm, for example, the flow will become turbulent, digestion will become disturbed, and similarly, the contents of the intestine, which include the bacteria, will become perturbed. What we've done, in a sense, is to go fishing in the river and to go searching there, among all the other things that are in the river, for those special bacteria that have properties that promote health. And then to go and isolate those bacteria, characterize them, purify them into a manner which has been given as an additive to food, which can then be used in individuals who actually have disease. The source of Carmel's pain and distress lay in the gut, and Quigley soon realized that the solution might be there also. Some of these millions of bacteria have better properties than others. Some of them will reduce inflammation, and others will promote better functioning of the gastrointestinal tract. Quigley and his team have been working over several years in the lab to try and identify the specific properties of the bacteria which may work against IBS. Based on our laboratory studies, we quickly focused on two particular bacteria, a lactobacillus and a bifidobacterium. It became clear that these were those that were most likely to work on irritable bowel syndrome. The next step then, the critical step, was to test these in a clinical trial. I got a call from Professor Quigley's office inviting me to take part in a trial and at that particular stage I would have tried anything. I just needed help and I attended the clinic for a couple of months trying out these probiotic yogurts and I was so many weeks taking the yogurt and so many weeks not taking it and subsequently I began to improve physically, mentally, every way. I always enjoyed life but I just have a better quality of everything now and I just look forward to every day as it comes along. We were absolutely delighted with these results. The next step then was to go on and perform an even bigger study with over 400 patients and again we reproduced exactly the same results. Now in fact that larger study was the largest ever study performed in any condition with a probiotic. So we believe that putting these studies together provides the most comprehensive assessment yet 
of a probiotic in irritable bowel syndrome. And this really has been a very significant breakthrough. Quigley's work with the probiotics and IBS has shown some excellent results. Now, scientists are hoping to isolate more and more of these health-giving bacteria, which may have the power to fight even more destructive diseases. So some of the activities of the bacteria that are in the human gut protect us against infections like Listeria, uh, Clostridium difficile, and various infections, even MRSA. The bacteria in our body are the main protective device we have to protect against difficult bacteria like that. So we use fire to fight fire. Professor Colin Hill of UCC began looking for the bacteria containing a powerful weapon in the fight against a potentially fatal infection. One of our particular targets is Listeria monocytogenes. And that's not a very common disease, but unfortunately when it does occur, it's very often fatal. So it's very rare, but in those people that get it, uh, there's about a 30 to 40 percent chance of actually dying as a result. A healthy individual infected with listeria may display no symptoms, but it can adversely affect pregnant women and those whose immune system is not working correctly. Although a pregnant mother may only experience mild flu-like symptoms, it's the unborn baby that suffers the real consequences, which could be meningitis, encephalitis or even death. Because it's so rare, it doesn't lend itself to vaccination strategies or to um, people going on antibiotics when they're pregnant. Uh, but because it's so fatal, it's an important disease to control. So we need to find some kind of alternative way of protecting pregnant women against listeria. And so what we're attempting to do is to use probiotics during pregnancy to reduce even further the risk of contracting listeriosis. The challenge which Colin set himself and his team was not only to find out a way to treat this infection, but also to prove for the first time, unequivocally, the exact genetic mechanism which was driving it. The starting point, again, is the human gut. They began screening selections of bacteria which are present there. So of those thousands of bacteria, we looked at their ability to kill listeria in the lab on plates such as this. And what we found was that some bacteria, like this one, UCC118, could kill listeria, while others cannot. So what you can see here is that this bacteria is able to kill this other bacterium at quite a considerable distance. In fact, in human terms, this would be a distance of maybe 20 kilometers. So we've got one bacteria capable of killing other bacteria at a considerable distance and in a very powerful way. And what we wanted to do was see if we could use that bacteria to do the same thing in the gut. Once Colin and his team had identified the bacteria which can successfully kill listeria, the challenge was to try and figure out how exactly it did that. By first isolating genes which give off light, they created a strain of the disease which effectively glows in the dark. In this way, they were able to track the progress of the infection initially in the test tube and subsequently in mice. And what you can see here is a mouse that has been infected with these uh, newly made listeria and you can see the listeria glowing in the gut of the mouse, indicating that this mouse is infected. So the next stage was to give a mouse a probiotic and then follow that with infection with listeria. And as you can see here, this mouse uh, received the probiotic and then was infected with the same level of listeria as the mouse on the left. But as you can see, there's no light emitting from the mouse at all. In other words, the probiotic has killed the listeria as it arrived in the gut and will protect this mouse from any further infection. This was really exciting that we'd shown now that this probiotic, UCC118, can actually protect mice against listeria. But what we wanted to do was prove how it was protecting the listeria, or the, the mouse against listeria. So we uh, took the same strain, the same probiotic, but this time we knocked out, we removed the gene that allows it to kill listeria, and we treated a mouse with that probiotic, and what you can see is that the listeria can infect that mouse. So in other words, the ability to infect is completely linked to the presence or absence of the gene for this compound. Uh, and this is the first time we believe that this has been shown uh, in, the, in the lab. Colin Hill's work was published on the front cover of one of the most prestigious journals in the world, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, or PNAS. The significance of this work is it's the first example, and an elegant one, where a group has shown that a probiotic culture 
can protect an animal against a disease and show the exact mechanism involved. So the key to making advances in science is really understanding the basic mechanisms that underpin the phenomenon that you're observing. And in this case, we believe that knowing how bacteria can protect a mouse, in this instance against listeria, can help us develop uh, protective treatments for pregnant women, for example, uh, for other infections in, in healthy people. And we believe we're moving a long way down the road to using probiotics as anti-infective agents. Genetics is a vital part of all the biosciences, and there is no doubt that it will become increasingly so. Genomics is taking an organism apart, if you will, and looking at all the individual genes in the microbe that are responsible for its living, its metabolism, its own digestion, and in our case, beneficial activities that they exert upon us, their host in some cases. So by knowing what genes they contain, we can also predict activities and then optimize their beneficial uses. Colin Hill's work demonstrated the specific link between genes and the bacteria in our gut. However, it is not the gene which is the key to the story, but rather how powerfully those bacteria can fight disease. Well, genetics, our human constitution, certainly has an influence on the way in which our ba the bacteria colonize the human gut. We know this from studies of identical twins. But by far, no, a more important influence is the environment and lifestyle issues, consumption of antibiotics, sanitization in the environment, and foodstuffs have a far greater impact on the composition and the behavior of the bacteria in the gut than genetics. The identification of CLAs and bacteria, which can fight IBS and listeria in the human gut, is a wonderful development. It has opened the door to a whole new world inside our own bodies, with the potential not only to fight disease, but to prevent it occurring in the first place. Well, I have to confess that I'm an optimist when it comes to the subject of functional foods. I do believe that we will um, make a positive impact on the health of the population through foods. This is uh, through an intervention in the diet of, of healthy people. I'm not talking about the idea of foods being drugs, that is not at all the concept, but foods being something that is available and taken in by healthy people and, and through that they can influence the quality of their lives and, and offset the development of diet-related ailments. Well, despite initial scepticism, much of which was from myself, we have managed to separate uh, some of the science from some of the snake oil. And the next step now is to move from the observations in the research laboratory into testing in humans with these diseases. But that's not a short road. That involves rigorous, controlled scientific clinical trials. And we're at that stage now. I'm very optimistic about this. So the Gut bacteria are incredibly complex. Every individual has their own set of gut bacteria, which is as individual to you as your own fingerprint. In fact, we call it the bacterial fingerprint of the gut. And it really is a world that we have to explore, and we're only at the very surface of it. We can only culture, in other words, we can only grow in the lab some 20 to 30 percent of all the bacteria that are present in the gut. The rest of them are still completely mysterious to us. We're using much more modern technologies now to explore those bacteria, and we hope to continue to mine these bacteria for many, many years to come. Thank you.